Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace it's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Well, 
I hope that this uh, allows you to see a little bit of the dynamism that uh, the world has experienced, that the United States and other parts of the world continue to experience and see in this dynamic presentation a little bit of that dynamism that continues to characterize the progress of civilization away from the parochial towards the more universal and indeed progressive, the very best sense of the word civilization. At the same time, please notice that there has been considerable flux and change and movement, and there continues to be significant differences even within a single country. And it may, given some of the other things that John showed you in the other videos and that surely is represented by those 200 years of history, you can perhaps appreciate that we are in an increasingly equal and an increasingly at the same time competitive world. And so it is worthwhile remembering that uh, the status quo isn't what it used to be. In fact, if you advocate the status quo, you'll find yourself soon having no status in the quo. And that is also why, if you are an American, you can no longer show up on the world stage with a great big sign around our necks that says, I'm very expensive and I really don't know very much. Because increasingly, far many more people are just as educated, if not more so, and are willing to do what the world requires of us for lesser wages. Competition is global. Well, if you looked at that video and those data, you might have been in some ways pessimistically saying, I'm give up. If you are an optimist, uh, you would probably just say that it is uh, exciting. But perhaps you also want to ask, and what it is that we're about today is why has all of this come about? And I suggest that the answer can be found in three very simple words, innovation and entrepreneurship, and their reflection in the economy commercialization. Matt Ridley, a columnist, has recently noted, the more you prosper, the more you can prosper, the more you invent, the more inventions become possible. How can this be? The world of things, of pecans or power stations, is indeed often subject to diminishing returns, but the world of ideas does not. The more knowledge you generate, the more you can generate, and the engine that is driving prosperity in the modern world is the accelerating generation of useful knowledge. Ideas beget new ideas, and on and on and on. Brian Arthur, who recently wrote a marvelous book on the nature of technology, put it this way. Most of us do not stop to ponder technology. It is something we find useful, but that fades into the background of our world, yet technology also creates our world. It creates our wealth, our economy, our very way of being. You young people that uh, are here today are very comfortable with the world of iPads. Some of you have them in your hands as I speak. With the world of iPhones and PDAs and Androids and Googles and also and so forth. Many of our generation are still trying to catch up with you. But around the world, there are dozens and thousands of people just like you, young people, who are right up to date. For you, that technology is already in the background. You're very comfortable. For us, it remains something that we have to learn. You will have an opportunity to invent new technologies that shape the nature of the world. And those technologies are not even here, so we cannot take them for granted. They're not in the background yet. The fact is that progress only occurs as a result of determined effort by someone. And think about it. When a friend asks you how a project is going, you don't say, well, I'm waiting for progress, or I'm experiencing progress. What you say is, I am making progress. And the history of mankind is a story of advancement generated by invention and entrepreneurship. And as Americans, we should take some pride, but not complacency, in the contribution that our country has made in all of these areas. Americans invented the airplane, the airbag, and aspartame, barcodes and credit cards and corrugated cardboard, the integrated circuit, the internal, the internet, Kevlar and the light bulb, Morse code, the pacemaker, vulcanized rubber, the synthetic skin. We pioneered the modern zipper, 
even the Zamboni, that thing that clears up the ice in, in the courts, you know, in, what do we call that, hockey? Yeah, there you go. Even the Zamboni is a triumph of the American spirit, as is, by the way, modern-day agriculture. First, we invented the self-polishing steel plow, which allowed crops to be grown in sticky clay. This opened the heartland to farming. Then we invented the cotton gin, the reaper, the corn picker, and the tractor. Farm science and old-fashioned hard work improved crop and animal health. It spurned exponential growth in yields, improved human nutrition, and virtually eliminated dietary disease in the Western world, and it made the United States the world's breadbasket. When we aren't investing something, it seems that we Americans are always finding ways to apply the discoveries that others have made. We didn't discover penicillin, for example, a Frenchman did. We didn't discover its ability to kill infections, and we didn't lead the clinical trials that demonstrated that. The British did that. But when mass quantities of penicillin were needed during World War II, it was Americans who figured out how to produce it fast enough and cheap enough to make it available worldwide. We did not invent the internal combustion engine or the automobile, though it sometimes seems as, we should, as though we should have, because an American, Henry Ford, perfected the assembly line which made mass production possible and allowed ordinary people to purchase cars and travel to where the good jobs were and return home at the end of the day. And to make the commute safer, Clevelander Garrett Morgan invented the traffic signal. Our increased mobility made work more profitable, commerce more economical, information more accessible, and the result was nation-changing and indeed world-changing. Average incomes and home ownership skyrocketed. More efficient and cheaper transport of goods led to a stronger economy. The American automobile industry and the transportation revolution it sparked changed our landscape both literally and figuratively. American discovery and innovation have strengthened our nation and our way of life. Even before information technology revolution came about, studies revealed that as much as 85% of the growth in America's income per capita was due to technological change. By leading the way, Americans have carved out a competitive position that has been the envy of the world for more than a century. In part, this success, this success is due to a national culture that rewards risk-taking. And it is no coincidence that ours is a nation of both immigrants and inventors, because both immigrants and inventors require a wisdom and courage to recognize that opportunity often involves considerable risk. Now, for many people, when they are confronted with a risky situation, they get into a state of anxiety. They start worrying, and sometimes worrying leads to something called analysis paralysis. You think about it so much that you don't do anything about it. But I want to remind you that risk and anxiety are two quite different conditions, okay? And I want to share a simple story that illustrates the point. The Surgeon General, you see, tells us that cigarettes kill more than 440,000 Americans each year, and automobiles on our highways kill more than 30,000 people each year. But nobody seems to be afraid of cigarettes or automobiles. We certainly love our cars. We may not like cigarettes, but we're not particularly afraid of them. However, according to the Deputy Director of the National Institutes of Health, everyone is afraid of sharks. The Navy says that there are about 70 shark attacks worldwide each year. The National Bureau of Health Statistics doesn't even keep a record of shark attacks because there are so few. They know how many people are killed by bee stings, but not by shark bite. The best guess is that sharks may kill maybe two or three people each year in the United States. But the fact is that if you went to a crowded beach and shouted shark, everyone would race out of the water, jump into a car, light up a cigarette, and drive home. <laughs> now, if you'll ponder that for a minute, you'll quickly come to understand that that is the difference between anxiety and risk. But where reason and calm prevail, there is always optimism for the future and much innovation that we can accomplish for the common good of all of us. And so for the balance of my remarks this morning, I want to develop two themes briefly. First, I want to review examples of how technological innovation and entrepreneurship have powered our national economy. 
And then to conclude, I want to go back to some of the things that John illustrated in his videos and in his comments by giving you a little bit of a lesson on entrepreneurship, wealth creation, and a glimpse of what may be even some tantalizing visions of what the future may hold for you. At the outset, we need to understand that the primacy that America has long enjoyed around the world is increasingly being challenged, perfectly illustrated not only by the video I showed, but by, are you ready? See, being challenged, our primacy is being challenged by the very same forces of technological innovation that we as a country unleashed ourselves, but it's now everywhere. Due to the rapid advances in wireless technologies and the internet, communication is no longer constrained by physical location and time, so education and training, research and development, collaboration and investment can occur at any time, any number of entities worldwide. We have brought about an age of global change in which the peoples of the world and its markets are moving increasingly towards one another, just as we witnessed in that dynamic bubble chart to video. And in this global internet-driven economy, the issue is no longer just a matter of simple competition. It is one of America's capacity to innovate and thereby continue to have economic growth. The President of the United States said this, our future progress and prosperity depend upon our ability to equal, if not surpass, other nations in the enlargement and advance of science, industry, and commerce. To invention, we must turn as one of the most powerful aids to accomplish such a result. Sounds pretty good. Please note, however, that those words did not come from President Barack Obama, but from President William McKinley, and the year was 1899. Hope you find comfort as well as encouragement in that fact. Yours is not the first generation, nor will it be the last, to face international competition and technological change. You are simply the latest to do so. And I submit that the future always has been predicted by the technologies that created it with scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, mathematicians, and other innovators leading the way. About the time that William McKinley delivered the words that I quoted for you a moment ago, some of American's dominant industries at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century were hardware, bicycles, and telegraphy. And more than half of our entire American population still lived and worked on farms. Today, less than 2% of our population is involved in agriculture. That is the power of technology creating the productivity that made America the breadbasket of the world, and it freed us to do other things that today define the 21st century economy. And indeed, entirely new industries became the products of 20th century innovation from airlines and automobiles to microelectronics, biotechnology, robotics, and many more. It was innovation that made possible the agricultural and industrial revolutions of the last century. And during World War II, innovation also, innovation that was vital to the US war effort, also laid the groundwork for technological leaps in medicine, aviation, energy, electronics, developments that today continue to affect virtually every realm of human endeavor. The development of transistors in the late 40s ushered the era of microelectronics and sowed the very first seeds of what became Silicon Valley. And from such modest beginnings, we're now immersed in the information age. Research conducted during the space race that was illustrated by Neil Armstrong's first steps on the moon not only put him on the moon, but also gave rise to the space industry and enabled new technologies in satellite communications, computer science, robotics, and miniaturization. And as recently as 1970, a single discovery in molecular biology initiated the new industry of biotechnology, which has led to dramatic advances in medical science and the introduction of effective new technologies, such as the production of human insulin by factories of microorganisms. Now, there are a few things that economists agree on. On the one hand, on the other hand, you've heard it before. But the one thing they do agree upon is that the research and development that produces new technological knowledge is our most direct economic avenue for acquiring added value. In other words, it is from research that new companies are born, that new jobs are created. It is from research that the economy expands and that new wealth is created. 
And so let's ask how much new wealth. Well, it turns out a lot. The Kaufman video illustrated that a little bit, but let me give you a few examples. Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, predicted in 1965 that processing power would double every 18 months with corresponding price decreases. That prediction became known as Moore's Law, as increasing and more affordable power carried us from mainframes to PCs to today's Blackberries and, main, and uh, uh, iPhones and iPads. Along the way, innovative companies have developed networks, linkages among networks, and the internet, and that, according to Robert Metcalf, a pioneer of computing network, creates even more value. How much more value? According to him, the value of networks grows with the square of the number of users. And someone has tried to capture this in, in real numbers and asked what the, each successive wave of in, the computer technology has meant to us economically. And he said that for each successive wave, there's been a tenfold increase in wealth creation. So from $80 billion in the mainframe area to $800 billion in the uh, era of the personal computer uh, to what is now rapidly approaching $8 trillion in the current internet area and PDA assistance. But he sees that in the networking, the capturing of the value of that information in networks and networks of networks, we will soon see $80 trillion of value. And that is the power of innovation in just one industry. Yesterday's world, which ran largely on manpower, has been supplanted by this modern age of information and advanced technology, technology that can only be developed through science and research and development, and the dynamics power of this brave new world is no longer factories per se, but America's research universities, which do more than, the nation, more than one half of the nation's basic research. And equally important, we concurrently nurture the innovative spirit among young men and women. Young minds are awakened, inspired to dream and explore, resulting in innovation and advancement. Their discoveries feed other bright minds, creating a cycle of discovery and enlightenment that is never-ending and inextricably linked. Because ask yourself, where do new ideas come from? They come from one good idea crashing into another idea, creating a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, etc. And remember that quote that I gave you at the very beginning of my talk, the more knowledge you generate, the more you can generate. The results of this cycle have tangible, visible impacts on all of our everyday lives. And there is perhaps no better example than California Silicon Valley. And I could tell you about it, but you already know about it. You, you, you live it with all of the things that you're familiar with. But it didn't exist before 1950. And in 62 short years, basically, it has gone from a sleepy, hollow little set of villages just south of San Francisco to one of the world's most dynamic entrepreneurial regions in the world. And think, of course, of the companies that are like, there, like Cisco Systems, Silicon Graphics, Sun Microsystems, Apple, Google, etc. And its lead university, Stanford, routinely places graduate students in local startups to learn about entrepreneurship just as Deanna does at RPM and other good companies in our area. Today, Silicon Valley, 62 years later, is home to more than 7,000 established high-tech firms, a place where an estimated 11 new companies are created every week. We should be so fortunate, and perhaps we are, because we are the polymer capital of the world, Polymer Valley, and we've gone from four companies in the 1870s to in excess of 2,000 companies today dealing with advanced materials out of polymeric material. And by the way, take the minerals and the, and the water out of your bodies, the rest of your polymeric structures. Okay. So just as generations that preceded yours needed to become computer literate, your generation must become even more innovation literate. So much so that generations that follow yours must see that, innovation, that the innovation process is an inherent part of life. Because that's where the opportunities always have lied, and that's where they will increasingly lie. And there is indeed much that each of you can and will contribute. And in, in John's uh, uh, videos and in his comments, as you become the agents of change, you'll go on to invent the future, and to create wealth. Now, please notice 
just as we did with anxiety and risk, that I said create wealth, not accumulate wealth. While both are certainly permissible and central to the free enterprise system, they are very different. Accumulating wealth leads only to individual riches, nothing wrong with that, okay? But creating wealth will allow you both to expand the economy, thereby enriching the community and benefiting the others in the common good at the same time that you benefit and may get inspired to do it again and again and again as many serial entrepreneurs have done. Columnist Daniel Asks puts it this way, I quote, if you have a good education, you shouldn't just consider getting rich. Creating wealth is a moral obligation. Do so and you can take comfort not just in financing public services, but in knowing that you are giving people what they need and want. 